What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about acute lymphoblastic leukemia, also known as ALL. Before we get started, if you guys really do like this video, it makes sense to you, please support us. And I really mean this. One of the easiest ways that you guys can go about supporting us for these free videos is by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and please subscribe. It really goes a long way. Also, I really urge you guys, if you guys have the opportunity and the ability, go down in the description box below, go to our website. We have some amazing notes and illustrations that I truly do believe will help you guys to understand this topic and follow along with me as we go through this together. But let's get into talking about ALL. So, with ALL, or acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the problem is within hematopoiesis. So what is hematopoiesis? It's the production of all blood cells. And really this should occur in the red bone marrow, right? So all we're doing here is that we're taking a chunk of this actual bone marrow and we're just zooming in on it and looking at all the actual cellular division that's occurring there. And then we have to talk about it a little bit. So if you guys remember from our videos that we've talked about this before, we have a kind of like a stem cell that generates all blood cells. Do you guys remember what this is called? Some people call it the pluripotent stem cell. Some also call it a hemocytoblast. And then what happens is it differentiates. It differentiates what's called a lymphoid stem cell and a myeloid stem cell. And if you guys remember from the AML video, the myeloid stem cell will then actually differentiate in the presence of something called like erythropoietin it'll go into making what's called red blood cells. Then, if it has the presence of what's called TPO, or thrombopoietin, it'll go to make platelets. And then if it has the presence of like colony stimulating factors, it'll then go to become what's called a myeloblast. And then myeloblast, in the presence of other colony stimulating factors and interleukins, will then go to become something called a granulocyte. And there's different types of granulocytes, if you guys remember. This is your neutrophils, your eosinophils, and your basophils. So this was the process of hematopoiesis down this cell line. But down this one, it's a little bit, bit different, right? So we have this lymphoid stem cell. It can become a generic type of blast. We call this a lymphoblast. Now what can happen is that the lymphoblast can differentiate just a little bit further. And when they differentiate a little bit further, they become something called a B lymphoblast. So you can have what's called a B. Here, I'm actually going to write this one over here. So we can have two different types of lymphoblasts, if you will. One is called the B lymphoblast, and the other one is called the T lymphoblast. And these are just two different types of just slightly further differentiated lymphoblasts. But then what happens is, is that these lymphoblasts, the B lymphoblasts and the T lymphoblasts, they should differentiate a little bit further in a true, perfect kind of like world. And how do they differentiate? They differentiate completely <clears throat> into something called T cells and B cells, or we can call them T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. So what these really should become eventually is that these should become T cells and these should become B cells, or also known as B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. And technically the T cells, they should further go and differentiate and become a little bit more specialized in the thymus. So these are the only ones that'll go to the thymus. Whereas the B cells, these will generally go to the lymph nodes. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. So the B cells generally go to the lymph nodes, and then the T cells will go to the thymus, and some will go to the lymph nodes. But we'll talk about these a little bit later. But the problem really comes in discussing this is what is the true breakdown in this hematopoiesis process? So we said ALL is a breakdown within the hematopoiesis pathway. And really what happens is, is just similar to like AML, is that in ALL, there's a problem where the lymphoblasts become just a little bit more differentiated and they become these things called B lymphoblasts and T lymphoblasts, right? And what happens is, is they get stuck right here. They get stuck right here and they can't further divide and differentiate to become functional T cells and functional B cells. So you end up with decreased functional B cells and functional T cells. And you end up with a ton of these T lymphoblasts and B lymphoblasts. And that's where the problem really comes in, is that there is a problem where these cells are stuck in this division stage of continuing to form more and more and more lymphoblasts without fully differentiating and making functional B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. So the question then comes into the next part of this lecture, which is what would be the reasons why that we would have so many of these T lymphoblasts? What would be the reason why we would have so many of these B lymphoblasts? And so if you guys remember, here was our hemocytoblast becoming our myeloid stem cell, becoming our lymphoid stem cell. Then this one went down and became all these different cell lines that we already talked about. Let's focus on this one. Here we have the T lymphoblast. Here we have the B lymphoblast. And it just does not become a B cell. And it does not become a T cell.
So it's stuck in this stage where it just continues to keep replicating and dividing without ever dying and having tons of these dang lymphoblasts and less functional T cells and B cells. So what's the reason why it's stuck in this? All right, one reason is it could be due to chemoradiation. Just as we talked about this in the lecture on AML, the chemoradiation may cause DNA mutations. So there may be some type of mutation, right? So you have the DNA, here's your DNA, and then here's maybe a gene that has now gained the capacity to continue to replicate without the cell dying. This gene is now mutated from the chemoradiation. When it mutates in this particular way, maybe it then gains the ability and the capacity to continue to keep replicating. And so the DNA replications go haywire. And if you have tons of DNA replication without the cell actually dying, that's how you end up with these massive amounts of T lymphoblasts and B lymphoblasts without actually completely fully becoming a differentiated T cell and B cell. So that's one reason. The second reason is it actually can be genetic. Let's actually bring these up here. So genetic etiologies is another possibility here. So when I say genetic, there is some type of predisposition. And there is three particular reasons. One is it could be associated with what's called Down syndrome. And we talked about this prior in the AML lecture. So you can see Down syndrome associated with AML and ALL. And this is also known as trisomy 21. So trisomy 21. The other particular chromosomal abnormality is that you form a fusion gene. And this is usually due to two different types of translocation. So there's a translocation. We talked about this one in the AML lecture. It was the most important one was 1517 for APL. The translocations in ALL, there's two particular ones. One is called the 1221 translocation. And this one, what happens is, it's the same kind of concept here. Here you have, let's say, a chromosome 12. Here you have chromosome 21. And what you do is you just swap some of the genetic material. And you make this like weird fusion gene. And when you make this weird fusion gene, this fusion gene gains the capacity to continue to keep replicating and dividing without dying. And that's how you end up with these massive amounts of these T lymphoblasts and B lymphoblasts. The other concept is that it could be due to another translocation, and this is a really important one, my friends, 922 translocation. And this concept, you again have chromosome 9, chromosome 22, and you're just swapping some of the genetic material and you make a very, very important fusion gene. So we call this the Philadelphia, I'm gonna put Philadelphia chromosome. And what happens is you make this weird fusion gene. Here was the fusion gene here, here's the fusion gene here, and this one's actually really important. We call this a BCR able gene. And this is really important for 922 translocations. But again, the same concept exists here where these fusion genes gain the capacity to continue to allow for excessive amounts of DNA replication without the actual cell dying. So become immortal essentially. Now, one big thing here is that 1221 translocation is common in children, which makes this an unfortunate and sad situation. 922 translocations are more commonly associated with adults. So it's less common. The more common translocation that is commonly seen in ALL is the 1221 translocation. So if you have to remember which one is more common, please remember that this is the more common one. However, it is important to be able to determine if they have this one. The reason why is, is there's a different treatment for this particular translocation and this particular gene that's present. It's a different treatment regimen. Okay. The third and final reason that someone can develop ALL is a weird one, and it's more specific to the T-cell ALL. And this is usually due to an infection. So there's an infection, a specific type of virus. It's called the human T-lymphotropic virus. So we call this the HTLV virus, so the human uh, T-cell lymphotropic virus. This one is primarily only associated with T-cell ALL. So there's two different types of ALL if you really want to think about it. You can have an ALL where it's primarily the B lymphoblast and the T lymphoblast that are the problem. Which one would be the more common one? If I actually had to pick between these, these B lymphoblasts and the T lymphoblasts, this one is about 20% of ALLs, and this one is about 80% of ALLs. So therefore, when someone has ALL, which is the more likely cell line to be affected? The B cells. So you're likely to see a B cell ALL 
more than you'll see a T cell ALL. But if you do see this one, what's the one particular thing that you have to think about? HTLV, okay? So I'll add this one on here as well as an important kind of high yield thing to take away. All right, my friends, so now we've covered at this point the abnormal hematopoiesis pathway, and we covered the reasons why we have tons of these B lymphoblasts and T lymphoblasts. Now let's talk about the consequences of these now. All right, my friends, so now we got all these T lymphoblasts and B lymphoblasts just populating like bunnies within this dang bone marrow, right? And what was the reason why again? It could be due to chemo radiation causing mutations, or it could be due to genetic abnormalities associated with like trisomy 21, Down syndrome, which you can see in AML and ALL. And don't forget the translocations that cause weird fusion genes that cause excessive DNA replication. And again, these cells can divide, divide, divide without dying. They evade apoptosis, they become immortal. And then the last one is that you could have a T cell ALL associated with human T cell lymphotropic virus. And again, which one of the more common one? B cell ALL is 80%. T cell ALL is 20%, so it's way more common to see an ALL with a B lymphocyte predominance. Okay, we got all of these lymphoblasts that are just populating in the bone marrow, and they crowd out the bone marrow, and they cause a lot of problems. So what are some of these problems? Well, one thing is, let's see all these cell lines. So because you have these massive amounts of lymphoblasts, these are gonna be super high, because you're just continuing to replicate and divide these without them differentiating and maturing into true T cells and B cells, and because of that, you're taking up so much space in the bone marrow and you're hogging all the nutrients that is needed for red blood cell production and platelet production. <clears throat> so now, uh, these cell lines become affected and they drop. What is the reason why these cell lines drop? Because there is decreased space and decreased nutrients available for them to continue to undergo their production process. So you drop these other cell lines. When we have all these lymphoblasts, in the bloodstream, one of the problems is, is that these have a decreased, they are decreased functional white blood cells. So you have these decreased functional white blood cells. They aren't able to perform their normal functions, which is fight off particular types of pathogens, release cytokines, promote an inflammatory reaction, and fight off infections. If I can't do that, <laughs> that's a problem. So now I'm gonna lose the ability of these poor things to be able to perform their natural functions. And so that's a downside to this one. And so one of the big things that you wanna remember is that now you have less functional white blood cells, this is gonna to lead to a high risk of infections. And infections for these patients tend to be one of the higher mortality causes of death. So this, is, this produces the high mortality factor, which is associated with leukemia. Now, one of the ways that this can present is they can present with pneumonia, they can present with a UTI, they can present with some type of cellulitis or abscess of the skin. And so this is various different ways that the patient may present. But again, I think the big thing to remember is because you have less functional white blood cells, there is a higher risk of infections associated with this. The other component here is that you drop down your number of red blood cells. And because you drop down your number of red blood cells, you actually can cause anemia. Now anemia would be evident if you got a CBC and showed that there was low numbers of red blood cells. But one of the ways that these patients can present is they can present with pallor due to a decreased hue to their skin. You know, red blood cells, if they're oxygenated properly, and have enough of them, they should give a nice like pinkish reddish hue to the skin. But if you don't have enough of them, then you're not gonna have that nice pinkish reddish hue and they develop a pallor. They're also supposed to supply oxygen to tissues that help us to be able to perform normal functions, give us energy. We lose that then, we become fatigued. And on top of that, you can develop dyspnea because of less oxygen carrying capacity. Now, that's one particular feature that we could also see here associated with this. Now, the other component is that we have less platelets because of that space problem. So because of that, we call this thrombocytopenia. And the problem with thrombocytopenia is that yes, you could see this on the CVC showing low levels of platelets, but they could physically present with, platelets are supposed to do what? They're supposed to clog up holes in blood vessels if they're broken or ripped up. And if you can't do that now, now you'll bleed through those holes. And you can develop little bruisings on the skin, which we can call petechiae. You can see bigger ones like papyrrha. You can see even bigger ones than that, like ecchymosis. Or you could literally bleed, like you get a nosebleed, you could get gingival bleeding, you could bleed through your GIT. So it's important to realize and look for features of bruising, which can kind of present as petechiae, could present as papyrrha, could present as ecchymosis, or you could present with evidence of bleeding. Epistaxis, gingival bleeding, or GI bleeding. So watch out for this as well as potential features and complications associated with this problem of high lymphoblasts. The last particular problem is, is that since you have so many lymphoblasts within the, blood, I mean, within the bone marrow, there's so many lymphoblasts that are just constantly replicating like bunnies 
in the bone marrow. What's the problem with that? Well now, if you have all these lymphoblasts in the bone marrow and you're making a ton of them, now the bone marrow has to be able to compensate and expand to make space for all these lymphoblasts. So what happens is you end up expanding the bone marrow. And when you expand the bone marrow, you actually cause kind of a distension and activation of pain receptors and nerves. And this will precipitate a bone type of pain, which may present with the child limping. And so watch out for maybe a limp or them complaining of particular bone pain in your areas where red bone marrow is actually present. These are the big features that I want you guys to watch out for, which is associated with lots and lots of lymphoblasts within the bone marrow. Here's the next part though. The next complication is, is that we know that B lymphoblasts and T lymphoblasts are made particularly within the bone marrow. But then what happens is, as we said prior, is that these should get pushed into the bloodstream. When they get pushed into the bloodstream, they're supposed to go to specific areas of the body. Some will go to the lymph nodes, some will go to the thymus, some will go to the liver and the spleen, and some will go to other locations that we don't want them to go. What would that look like? So, if some of these lymphocytes went to the liver and the spleen, oh, these poor things, what happens is, it actually causes the liver, so now you're gonna deposit all these lymphoblasts into the liver and into the spleen. And what you end up with is something called hepato spleno megaly. A big old liver and big old spleen. And one of the problems with hepato spleno megaly is this can present with like nausea, vomiting, because if you imagine the liver and the spleen getting bigger, it's taking up a lot of space within the GIT and it can compress onto the stomach and onto the bowels. And so when food is supposed to go through there, it's supposed to go through there without any kind of compression or kind of like restriction. But now if you have things compressing onto the GIT organs, like your stomach and bowels, you're not going to be able to push food along easily. And so that causes a lot of nausea, vomiting, abdominal fullness. So watch out for that as well. So nausea, vomiting, and abdominal fullness. <clears throat> This is a big thing to watch out for, okay? So hepatosplenomegaly is relatively common with this one. The next one that I want you to remember, and I think this is probably the biggest one to remember, is that they can deposit into lymph nodes. So B cells and T cells naturally go into lymph nodes. And when they deposit into the lymph nodes, and you get tons and tons and tons of these, they can cause something called lymph adenopathy. Lymph adenopathy. And this is probably one of the most common features that you can see with any type of lymphocyte predominant type of leukemia. And you may see these within the cervical region or other areas around the body. So really, really watch out for this one. The other one is that some of these actual lymphoblasts get deposited into the meninges. Oh, this is a really, really sad one. And this is really, really unique and really important to differentiate between AML and ALL. <clears throat> if they did, they kind of deposit into the meninges, this can lead to something called meningeal leukemia. Meningeal leukemia. So they can literally, really, they can present like they have meningitis. And so watch out for features of meningitis. So headache, photophobia, phonophobia, you know, nausea, vomiting, maybe focal neural deficits. These are really, really in big altered mental status. These are really, really important things to watch out for. The other thing is that there's a lot of cranial nerves that move through and around the areas of the meninges, especially the sixth cranial nerve. And so when you get a lot of like deposition into the meninges and the kind of compressing onto the sixth cranial nerve, you can get a cranial nerve palsy. So also watch out for not just meningeal leukemia, but also watch out for what's called cranial nerve palsies with the most common one being six nerve palsy. Six nerve palsy. So watch out for any issues there. So if your six nerve isn't able to work, you can't abduct the eye, okay? So watch, whenever you perform their actual extraocular movements, if they are unable to abduct the eye, that could be a potential indication of this as well. All right, so so far we have them depositing into the liver and the spleen, causing big swelling of that one. Lymphadenopathy, this would not generally be a painful one. This would generally be kind of like a large, non-painful, non-tender type of swollen lymph node. Meningeal leukemia, they can literally present with features of meningitis or a cranial nerve palsy, specifically sixth nerve, inability to abduct the eye. The other problem here is that these son of a gun lymphoblasts can also deposit into the testes. And if they deposit into the testes, which is a really unfortunate thing in these children, it can cause testicular enlargement. So watch out for any type of testicular enlargement, which is a really, really unfortunate thing. It's not as common as compared to the meningeal leukemia, but it is something that you have to be aware of, that they can deposit into the testes. And again, I'd say some of the biggest, biggest features that really help to differentiate this from AML 
is the fact that they have lymphadenopathy and meningeal and testicular involvement. You can see rarely splenomegaly with uh, AML, but it is, it's not that common. I really would rather you remember hepatosplenomegaly more common seen in ALL than in AML, okay? Here's the other really interesting thing that helps us to further differentiate AML from ALL based upon pathophysiological presentation. Now, if you guys remember, the thymus sits on the heart right here, kind of like sits like right here. I'm going to draw this one in green. So it sits and overlies on top of the heart. What, did, what kind of cells, what kind of cells specifically, which ones deposit into the thymus? So this is our thymus here. Here's our thymus. Which specific types of lymphoblasts deposit into the thymus? I only mentioned one, the T cells. So if you get lots of T lymphoblasts, that are large and in charge and all, you know, all coming over here and depositing into the thymus, the thymus will get larger. When the thymus gets larger, so you cause what's called thymic enlargement, this can lead to a couple different types of problematic issues. Well, think about the things that it's compressing. It's big enough that it can compress on the trachea or bronchi. So if it compresses on the trachea and bronchi, so you get tracheal and bronchial compression, so we'll put trachea and then it can also compress this one right here. So it can compress here and here. It can compress the trachea and it can compress the esophagus. So it can compress the esophagus. Now another potential issue that you can also see is that it can also compress this structure here. So you see how you have this vein? It's supposed to come down right here. So you have what's called your brachiocephalic, you're supposed to have what's called this one right here. So you have your subclavian, IJ making the brachiocephalic, and then it'll come down right here and join and become the superior vena cava. This thymus could compress onto the superior vena cava as well. So we could compress three particular structures here. We can compress the trachea, which can lead to dyspnea and strider. We can compress the esophagus, which leads to dysphagia. And we can compress the SVC, which can cause SVC syndrome. And this can present with a lot of like swelling, like really large neck veins, or maybe a lot of like enlargement of the veins on the actual chest and the face and the arms, maybe a bluish kind of discoloration as well. And so that's a real big thing to take away from here, is that you can get thymic enlargement due to the T lymphoblast depositing. And this is really important. You would only see this, only see this one in T cell ALL. You can see all of these in either B or T cell, but you will only see this thymic enlargement in T cell ALL. And if they cause thymic enlargement, they can compress the trachea, they can compress the esophagus, and they can compress the superior vena cava, which may cause these particular types of clinical presentations. Okay? These are the real big things that I think help us to delineate AML from ALL based upon pathophysiological presentation. There is two other things that can present. I'm only going to write them down because we already harped on them in the actual lecture on AML. But there's two other presentations. One other presentation that you may potentially see is leukostasis. So you may see leukostasis, but I want you to remember that this is way more common in AML than it is in ALL. So that is another potential presentation. Remember what they get tons and tons of these actual blast cells, they get stuck within the bloodstream and they occlude the blood flow to the bloodstream and they can cause strokes, TIAs, right? They can cause headaches, they can cause a blockage of the pulmonary vessels causing hypoxemia and dyspnea. They can block the retinal vessels and cause vision changes or vision loss. And they can even block off the drainage veins of the penis to cause priapism. So that's all potentially seen as well as in ALL, but it is more common. I'd rather you associate this with AML. And the last one that you can also see is tumor lysis syndrome. And we talked about this one. This is whenever the cells, either you have a high tumor burden, so massive, massive amounts of white blood cells, or in these case, the lymphoblasts, that are actually present and getting stuck in capillaries and popping open, or they're getting chemotherapy and it's busting the cells open. And they're releasing potassium and phosphates and uric acid. And you can get an acute kidney injury associated with that. So again, you can also see tumor lysis syndrome and leukostasis, which we talked about, which is present in AML and ALL. So you can see this in AML and ALL. But these are the new things that I want you guys to remember. If you guys already watched our video on AML, these are the new types of presentations. But leukostasis and tumor lysis syndrome are also potential presentations that you can see in ALL. But I want you to remember leukostasis is more common in AML 
and tumor lysis syndrome, we'll discuss this a little bit further in treatment, is usually a complication of chemotherapy, but we've already talked about this in AML. Now, let's move on. At this point, we've come to the consideration that if a patient has ALL, we know that it's usually due to a problem with the lympho lymphoblast, the B or T cell line. We now know that they can present with potential alterations of blood cell lines. We also know that they can actually cause deposition and problems in multiple different organ systems and then potentially complications such as these that we discussed. Now what we need to do is move on to how do we diagnose it. When this happens, you start off with a CBC with a peripheral blood smear. It's kind of your general screening test. Now, what this will do is it'll tell us the effect that we had from all those lymphocytes that are in the bone marrow. They're crowding out the bone marrow, taking up space. What were the cell lines to be affected? What would happen to the red blood cell line? It will drop. What will happen to the platelet line? It will drop. And so because of that, what do we call this when we have low red blood cells? We may see low red blood cells as evidence of anemia on the CBC. We may see low levels of platelets or thrombocytopenia on the CBC. And that is again secondary to low space, the lymphoblasts crowding out the bone marrow. Now the question is what about the actual mature white blood cells? What happens to these? These are variable, I'm not even kidding. You can't like diagnostically rely on these. They could be high, they could be low. So you can have a lot of variability in your functional white blood cells. So these could be variable. So I just want you to remember that. That's not a reliable marker. Sometimes you may have leukopenia, sometimes you may have leukocytosis. But what's the most important part? The most important part is that you should have tons and tons and tons of lymphoblasts. That's really the big feature. Not as much the functional white blood cells, it's more the lymphoblasts. Yes, they are a white blood cell, but they're not fully functional. And so when you look at these, what you should see is tons and tons of lymphoblasts. And what we would find is, if I were to take a, a, a section of blood, if I took some blood out of a tube, and if I were to take all of that blood and put it on a slide, I theoretically, if there's tons of these lymphoblasts, there should be a strong chance I will see a good chunk of lymphoblasts on that slide from that blood that I took from you. And so what we would want to see is, is on a peripheral blood smear, I would want to see evidence of these particular cells called lymphoblasts. And if there is evidence of these immature lymphoblasts that are present on the blood smear, that's also indicative of ALL, okay? The reason why is you might be like, oh, well, what about AML? Well, AML, yes, it did have low red cell line. It did have low platelets. It did have variable white blood cells. But what kind of cells did it have on the peripheral blood smear? Myeloblasts with the hour rods. These will have specifically lymphoblasts, no hour rods. That's a really big telltale sign. All right, you're like, I'm not convinced. I'm still not convinced that it's definitely ALL. All right. Unfortunately, what we may have to do is a definitive diagnostic test. So definitively diagnose this, definitive uh, diagnosis is we will take a chunk of the bone marrow out. So when we take a chunk of the actual bone marrow out, uh, in this, I did not spell definitive, right? Let me actually respell this one here. Definitive, definitive, I'm a terrible speller. Apologize, guys. So definitive diagnosis, what I would want to do is, is I want to take a chunk of the actual bone marrow out. When I take the chunk of the bone marrow out, what I should see is what I talked about before. I should see massive, massive, massive amounts of lymphoblasts present within the bone marrow, crowding out the bone marrow, dropping all the other cell lines. So when I look here, what I should see is, I should see greater than 20% lymphoblasts that are present in the bone marrow. So I should see a super hypercellular bone marrow with that primary cellular component being lymphoblasts. If I see this, this is highly, highly diagnostic of a patient having ALL. So at this point, if I start off with the CBC with a peripheral blood smear, and it looked like this is definitely a possibility of ALL, you need to go to the bone marrow biopsy to definitively diagnose it and say, oh, dang, there is a lot of lymphoblasts here. Once I've done this, I have diagnosed ALL. But what I really want to be careful of is in AML, we diagnosed the same thing, AML off of CBC with peripheral blood smear and a bone marrow biopsy. But then we went on to do something called immunophenotyping in genetic studies. And the reason why we did that is to determine the subtype of AML. And the same kind of concept, there is no specific subtype of ALL. Well, there is, if you really want to think about it, there's T cell ALL and B cell ALL. So technically we can't say there's a subtype. 
but we also want to know is this a specific type of chromosomal abnormality like a 922 because that's a different treatment process just like in AML we wanted to know if there was the 1517 translocation because that was a different treatment process same kind of concept so we have to do immunophenotyping and genetic studies to help us out with our treatment and our prognostication so when I do immunophenotyping, what I want to know is, first thing is immunohistochemistry. Is there a specific type of like molecule that's present in this lymphoblast that is not seen in myeloid stem cells or in the, the myeloblasts? Do you guys remember that in this, you're going to have a very specific type of molecule called TDT, right? So in these lymphoblasts, in having these lymphoblasts, one of the particular types of molecules that is a telltale sign is they will be TDT positive, and they will be what's called MPO negative. Please tell me you remember what MPO was, myeloperoxidase. That was only seen in myeloblasts. There's one telltale sign. So if we have a ton of these lymphoblasts, and we check for a specific type of protein that is present only only in the lymphoblast and not present in the myeloblast, this is what we should see. So that's testing for a specific protein inside of the cell. Now what we wanna do is test for specific proteins on the outside of the cell. And how will I do that? Well, what I wanna know is what kind of CD proteins or cluster differentiation proteins are present on the outside of the cell? Because the type of cluster differentiation, the CD proteins determines if it's a T cell or a B cell. Oh, that's actually really helpful. So now I can actually use this to know, is it a T lymphoblast telling me that this is a T-A-L-L, or is this a B lymphoblast telling me that this is a B-A-L-L, with knowing the percent likelihood is that it's likely the B cell, right? 80% B-L-L, B cell A-L-L. Now, what I want to do is, is I want to find out what are the specific types of proteins that are present on the outside of these cells. So what we do is, we take these cells and we put them in a column and we run them through the column and put little antibodies that bind onto these proteins and they'll, they'll cause them to become fluorescent and light them up. And so what I would want to know is, is, is the specific type of proteins that are present on this T lymphoblast and B lymphoblast, what are they? Because that'll tell me which one it is. So if I know I have a patient who has ALL, I just want to know which one it is, right? So what I would do is I would run it through a column and I'd put an antibody that would bind onto these things and then I would have this like little fluorescent molecule and it'll light it up and tell me, oh, this is specific for this specific particular type of protein. So what are those particular proteins? In T lymphoblasts, the specific CD molecules that they have is CD2 to CD8 with the most probably like significant one is CD3 being the most important one within that CD2 to CD8. So if you see CD3 or anything from CD2 to CD8, that's highly suggestive of the T lymphoblast type. So this would be T-A-L-L. -L. All right, so now with the B lymphoblasts, they have another specific type of CD protein. So on theirs, when you actually tag these ones, the specific tag will light up for CD10, CD, 19, and 20. So CD, 10, 19, and 20. Now, when these are present, if you see these, it's obviously B type of lymphoblasts. And this is really, really important. So this is why flow cytometry is more beneficial for ALL. Do you remember it really wasn't helpful in AML? It's because there's no specific cluster differentiation proteins that really help to differentiate between the different types of AML. Most of them have the same cluster differentiation proteins. But these have different types of cluster differentiation proteins, which is helpful in identifying which type of lymphoblast is it. And that is important. So we've come through, we've determined, oh, the specific protein in the cell is TDT, not MPO. That tells us it's not AML. Again, we've already known that at this point, but it can just confirm a little bit more. We do flow cytometry to tell me, is it T cell ALL or B cell ALL? Remember, the low numbers is going to be the T cell. The high numbers are gonna be the B cells. All right, at this point, we now move into genetic studies. And this is a really important one as well. So what I wanna do is I wanna take the nuclear material and I wanna string it out and I wanna look at the chromosomes. And I wanna find, is there a specific chromosomal abnormality? Now we already know that there was the swapping of specific genetic material, two types, right? There was the swapping of genetic material, two types. There was a 12, 21 translocation and a nine, 22 translocation.
Out of these, which one was associated with children? This was associated with children. This one was associated with adults. But the real important thing here is that 1221 is more common, 922 is less common. However, with that being said, when we, yes, we can find these particular types of translocations present, one of the big things to be able to remember here is that with 922 translocations in this particular abnormality here, this involves a very specific type of treatment process. So the treatment is different. And that is crucial, my friends. So that's why we really wanna be able to identify the 922 translocation of the Philadelphia chromosome. Because if we find that's present, we will have to give them something called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Whereas if it's this one, it's a different, it's a chemotherapeutic regimen that we will kind of defer to a little bit more specifically. Now the last thing here, is once we've done the cytogenetic portion, which is finding the chromosomal abnormality, we will then come down and maybe take it a little bit further. So if I take it a little bit further, and I say, okay, I know that there was this 922 translocation that was present for the Philadelphia chromosome, but I know that when they do this, there's a specific fusion gene that's present, and if that is present in combination with the 922, I know that's highly suggestive of a very specific type of abnormality that has a different treatment process. What was this fusion gene? It was called the BCR able. If it is BCR able positive, and on top of that, a 922 translocation is present, this is important because this will involve the treatment with something called TKIs. These will be treated with what's called TKIs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And that is an important thing because what happens is the BCR able gene just hyperactivates these tyrosine kinase proteins and causes just excessive amounts of hyperstimulation and replication. This is why this, these lymphoblasts become immortal. But with that being said, at this point now, we've taken the genetic studies and we've said, okay, now the patient has ALL. We've determined that they have ALL based upon the immunohistochemistry. We said, okay, I know if it's T cell or B cell based upon the flow cytometry. And then I said, I can determine the chromosomal abnormality. But the real one that I need to know here is, is it 922? If that is present, is there the BCR able? If it is, that's important because that determines the treatment with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Now the last part here is that we have to talk about some tests for if the actual lymphoblasts are really, really in high amounts. They're getting into the bloodstream, they're moving through the bloodstream, and they're depositing into these different tissues. There's specific tests that we have to be able to recognize if they've deposited into different tissues. So it's really straightforward. If they deposited into the actual meninges, so they deposit into the central nervous system, what would it be a good test to think about for that one? I would want to get like a CT or MRI. So a CT or MRI would be able to tell me if there is any features of meningitis. So I would see it particularly enhanced on particular sequences on MRI. I also could consider a LP, and an LP would be positive for these specific types of lymphoblasts that are present within the actual subarachnoid space. So I could do an LP, or I could do a CT or MRI. We also see a lot of testicular enlargement. I could do a testicular ultrasound to be able to see, is there a large kind of mass present within the actual, again, testes. So if I wanted to do a testicular mass to find that, I would actually do a testicular ultrasound, is what I should put, testicular ultrasound. So again, you can do CT, MRI to look for enhancement of the meninges on the imaging, and an LP to find the high number of lymphoblasts that are present within the subarachnoid space, testicular ultrasound to find the testicular enlargement. So if there is thymic enlargement that's present, right, it's just pumping this sucker real big, it can cause a lot of mediastinal widening and mass effect. And so what you'd want to do is get a chest x-ray of the, a chest x-ray, or a CT of the chest, and this will be able to show that kind of like enlargement of the thymus and really enlargement of the mediastinum. The last one, if there's a lot of this kind of like de deposition into the actual liver and spleen, you'd see a lot of hepatosplenomegaly. And the hepatosplenomegaly can actually be picked up with an abdominal ultrasound, or it can be picked up with a CT scan of the abdomen. So these are potential things to be able to consider as additional tests to support the features and complications we talked about, about, about before. So if a patient has meningitis, right, you'd really want to be able to diagnose that, not just off physical exam findings, but imaging and lab testing, testicular enlargement, find that with potential physical exam and palpation, but also ultrasound to find the enlargement.
And then again, a thymic mask, you can have features of SVC syndrome, tracheal compression, like for the dyspnea and strider or dysphagia, but find the mass that's compressing that. And then again, if they have kind of uh, features of abdominal fullness, or kind of a larger abdomen, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, find the hepatosplenal megaly based upon that as well. All right, my friends, now let's talk about the treatment of ALL. All right, my friends, so now we're gonna treat the patient who has ALL. So regardless of it being kind of a B, a, uh, B cell ALL or T cell ALL, you kind of treat it relatively the same. So we start off with something called something called the combination chemotherapy. And so it's the same kind of concept we talked about in AML. So we have to start them off with chemotherapy, but there's two different types. So there's what's called systemic chemotherapy that we'll start off with on these patients. But then we have to do something else, and this is called intrathecal chemotherapy. And I'll talk about this in just a second, but you should understand that intrathecal is essentially you're putting things into the brain. And that should make sense off, right off the top of the dome because we remember that patients get that meningeal leukemia. <clears throat> so oftentimes, if they, we, we'll treat them, we'll actually do prophylactic treatment to prevent them from developing meningeal leukemia. But we have two different types, systemic chemotherapy and intrathecal chemotherapy. So when we start off with these, we do the same kind of concept as we did in AML. We automatically initiate what's called induction chemotherapy. So we do induction, then we do consolidation, and then after that, we do something called maintenance, chemotherapy, maintenance. And the whole goal is to get these patients all the way into the point of complete remission. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. The agents that we utilize here, and I don't think that this is something that you should focus a ton on, but I'm gonna put them there. But again, I wouldn't go too crazy having to spend too much time remembering this. But the way that I remember them is called CVAD. So I remember C, V, a, and then two Ds here. So with these, the first one is cyclophosphamide. So cyclophosphamide. Again, when we do our, our pharmacology lecture on all the chemotherapy agents, we'll go into this in more detail. The next one is called vincristine. The next one is called asparaginase, asparaginase. And this is a plus or minus. So sometimes we utilize this and sometimes we don't. The other one is called donorubicin. And the last one is called dexamethasone. And this is a steroid, so dexamethasone. And this is a steroid. These are the three particular, I mean, these are the actual drug regimen that we would utilize in a patient who has something like ALL. <clears throat> and we would use these within the phases of induction, consolidation, and maintenance. Now, once we've done this, we do this with a goal of hopefully being able to induce remission. So hopefully eradicating and causing the patient to become completely cancer free. Now, what happens is because ALL has the possibility of spreading to the brain and causing meningeal leukemia, which is a very, very frightening type of thing, we like to prophylactically treat them. So how do we do that? So what we'll do is, is we actually do a prophylactic treatment. And we will use two different ways of doing this. One is we'll use chemotherapy. And the other one is we'll use something called irradi uh, brain irradiation. And this will actually be a plus or minus. We can do cranial irradiation plus or minus. But the chemotherapeutic regimens that we would use is, we use something called methotrexate, and we use something called cytarabine, and we also can use something like steroids. The most important one, the one that you'll likely see on your exam, is going to be methotrexate. So, but these are the three chemotherapeutic regimens that we will utilize for intrathecal components. So we could actually do this via lumbar drain and then push this medication into the subarachnoid space, or we can do it via what's called like an EVD. We put like the catheter into the actual ventricle and squirt this medication into the ventricles. But either way, you're trying to just get this into the subarachnoid space and trying to be able to prevent the meningeal leukemia from occurring. So this is usually a prophylactic way. Another way that we can do this is we can do cranial irradiation therapy, but this is usually a plus or minus. So we can do cranial, plus or minus cranial irradiation after the chemotherapeutic regimen. But this is at least what I would want you guys to remember. This is a really important one. With ALL, they have a high risk of meningeal leukemia. You can treat them with systemic chemotherapy, but you should prophylactically do intrathecal chemotherapy to prevent meningeal leukemia by giving them intrathecal methotrexate, if you can remember the other two, great, plus or minus brain irradiation therapy. That is important. Now, if these fail, we have other advanced therapies. So there is other advanced 
therapies. And this gets into the other concept that we talked about, and there's two particular advanced therapies that I want you to remember. One is going to be what's called tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and the other one is called a bone marrow transplant. Now, in these two particular situations, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, there's one specific agent that we would utilize here. This is called a matinib. A matinib is the most common agent here. We utilize this in patients who are positive for the 922 translocation and they are positive for the BCR able gene. If they are positive for these particular things, then they meet the criteria to be treated with tyrosine kinase inhibitors such as imatinib. Now, if these patients fail chemotherapy, they fail chemo, they fail the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or they have a poor prognostic findings on their labs, then we will go to a bone marrow transplant. Prognostics. Then we will go to a bone marrow transplant, okay? Now, this is the general treatment. So the, to again, a recap this, we would treat them with induction, consolidation, maintenance chemotherapy with at least, if you can remember them, these particular agents such as cyclophosphamide, vincristine, plus or minus asparaginase, donorubicin, as well as dexamethasone. Hopefully with a goal of remission. We have to remember this one. We have to prevent them from developing meningeal leukemia. So we intrathecally treat them with chemotherapeutic regimens into the subarachnoid space, such as at least remember methotrexate. If you can remember cytarabine and steroids, great. Also, we may consider brain irradiation therapy to prevent this as well. In advanced therapies, we can do a bone marrow transplant if they failed all treatment re regimens with the chemotherapeutic med regimens and the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or if they have a poor prognosis. And then we can do TKIs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors like a matinib, if they're positive for that 922 or BCR able gene. The last thing is the complications, and we briefly talked about this prior. And the one complication that I really want you guys to remember here is the tumor lysis syndrome. Remember, leukostasis is more common in AML, not as common in AML, ALL. But if you do remember leukostasis, it was hydroxyurea and leukophoresis, and then get them to chemotherapy. But complications here, the most important one that I want you to remember is tumor lysis syndrome. And if you guys remember, it was the same kind of concept. I just don't want you guys to forget this because it's a high yield topic. If I take those cells, here's my uh, cells, the leukemic cells, and I hit them with the chemotherapy and they pop open, they release out their different contents. And the contents that they release out into the actual extracellular environment is phosphates, they release potassium, and they release uric acid. And these are problematic molecules because what they do is, this specifically will cause acute kidney injury. So how do we prevent them from developing all these uric acid crystals? We treat them with, what were the particular regimens? We do, one, IV fluids. Second, is we inhibit purines from converting into uric acid, which was allopurinol. Allopurinol. And then third, if most of the uric acid has already been formed, we bind up the uric acid and convert it into something else that's not nephrotoxic, which was rasburicase. Rasburicase. All right, my friends, that covers our entire discussion on ALL. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.